Happy New Year and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, reconvened meeting which was opened and adjourned on the 16th of December 2021. I am uh, Councillor Chris Atwell, Cabinet Member for Communities and Central Services. Um, please be assured that we have put uh, appropriate cleansing and social distancing measures in place to ensure that this meeting is undertaken in a COVID secure manner. Limited public seating has been made available and this has been allocated in such a way that all present are aware of the COVID secure protocols in place. This meeting is also being webcast to allow the public to attend remotely if they so wish. Uh, please be advised that the public seating area is not in view of the camera used to webcast this meeting. Uh, may I ask members to remain seated throughout the duration of the meeting where possible and to wear a face covering unless seated. If the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble at the turning circle at the end of King Henry Street past the university's park building. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust fire marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. May I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed and everyone speaking will be on camera. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Please can uh, everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when uh, you have finished. Um, let's do introductions. So let's start with members. Uh, Councillor Jeanette Smith, um, I'm here um, as part of the um, membership of this board. Thank you, Jeanette. Councillor Lee Mason, uh, opposition representative. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, officers. Uh, Natasha Edmonds, Director of Corporate Services. Thank you, Natasha. Claire Looney, Commissioning and Partnership Manager. Thank you, Claire. Sue Page, Finance. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and over the back. Um, Karolina Szczepaniak, the new Equalities and Diversity Officer. Thank you, Karolina. And thank you, James. Do you want a moment? <laughs> Apologies for my slight tardiness, Chair. Um, George Fielding, Labour Group. Thank you, George. Thank you. No apologies for absence. And uh, any declarations, members? Yeah, just my uh, normal one, which is I'm in full-time employment of um, Hampshire Branch Unison. And there's nothing on the agenda that precludes me from sort of speaking, but um, just to declare that that's one of my interests. Thank you. Any other declarations? No. Okay, there are no deputations. So we'll move on to... Business. Let's get to business. Queen's Jubilee. Claire Looney, you're here, Partnership and Commissioning Manager. Um, thank you very much for the report. Um, is there anything in addition to it that you'd like to uh, comment on or let us know about? Chair, thank you very much. I think I just want to stress the fact that we're really looking forward to having four days of activities across the city, which will help build on that sense of community and the sense of community cohesion that has really emerged from the pandemic. But instead of um, that being about addressing the pandemic, it's an opportunity for those communities to come together to, to celebrate and reflect on the 70 years of service which the Queen will have given to this country. We are aware that we've tried to get a geographical spread with those activities. We've also tried to ensure that we are responding to the national program of activities that occur, but in a fun and Portsmouth specific way. So it makes it relevant to us as a city and gives lots of opportunities for communities to do their own thing within a wider framework. We hope that the collection of activities that we have proposed from a beacon lighting, which is a very traditional way of marking a national um, centenary, oh, not centenary, it's not 70, 100 years, apologies, uh, a 70th anniversary, which is a complete unique anniversary for us to be celebrating as a jubilee, with one in the north of the city and one in the south of the city, will then be followed by four days of activities through that extended bank holiday weekend at the beginning of June, 
we have the very much loved and very welcomed proposal around street parties where possible in directly communities to hopefully bring those communities together. We also have the opportunities for the big lunch activities which would be on the Sunday and that's especially targeted at those communities where perhaps for reasons such as transport reasons being on a major uh, road infrastructure they are unable to close their road and have a street party. Alternatively we also have um, the opportunity for something new and different around the environmental legacy projects with an opportunity for wards to bid in for uh, activities to make an environmental enhancement to their direct area as well as a series of other activities which will be complementary and will emerge over the next few months such as communities getting involved in the plant a tree for the jubilee part of the queen's jubilee canopy program and also our own opportunity and dedicated exhibition of the silver which will think be a very exciting opportunity to see some of those city treasures and also some of the navy treasures so the navy have also loaned us a number of items which are going to be part of that exhibition so we're hoping that this will be an a, a community, or very community orientated program of activities for communities to celebrate and mark what will be a very unique celebration for that jubilee. Yes, thank you Claire and um, the, the central theme of communities coming together in, in, in the spirit of fun and friendship I think is is what the, um, the Royal Household wants us to, to deliver and I think we're probably all ready for something like that. Um, Hopefully, we'll be able to do that in June. And also, the, the, the silver exhibition will be fascinating, I think, for people. It will include the Braganza plate. It's going to include all sorts of wonders, many of yeah. which have not been seen for a long yeah. time. So, as I say, it will include a number of things from the Royal Navy has opened their trophy collection, because obviously that integral maritime history for the city is really important. So, they'll be contributing elements to the City Museum exhibition, which will be on show. Terrific, isn't it? Um, so, lots, lots happening. So, uh, Opposition spokespersons, Lee? Um, you read my mind, because I was planning to ask about the Catherine of Braganza plate as well. We're very so, similar. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I, I was a little bit scared then, thinking I'd be doing my search history. That actually is held by the cathedral, so is there any chance that they're going to join in with the sharing of their treasures? I can certainly ask. Okay. I know in the past when we tried to have them tied up with our, we have the tankards of a similar age, they haven't been quite so willing to. But hopefully they might be willing to put forward and have be involved as well with put forward their treasures. Well, for full, full disclosure, I'm a member of Cathedral Council as well, so... Uh, nudge. <laughs> I, I, I can speak with the Dean. The, the Cathedral, I, th I think we're also talking to the Cathedral about um, a, a, a special service as well um, to, to sort of take place. Um, but good, thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, any other questions on Queen's Jubilee arrangements? Happy. Just welcome really that they is spread across the city and pleased to hear there's going to be a beacon lighting at Fort Woodley as well as at the Southsea Castle so thank you for that. Good well thank you Claire and thank you for explaining that there'll be um, I hope opportunities for everybody uh, who, who wants to take part over the, the, the long weekend or the very long weekend isn't it four day weekend um, to, uh, to, to have some fun and to, uh, to, to come together with um, other people in the communities. Um, thank you. Um, it is recommended that the outline programme of events can proceed and that the request for £50,000 funding to support them will be found from a proposed one-off increase to the service 2022-23 budget being considered by the City Council next month. Thank you, Claire. Um, the next item, Member Champions Protocol. Uh, James Harris, Senior Local Democracy Officer, is here to tell us about it. If you give us a quick outline James that would be helpful. Thank you Councillor Atwell. Um, so members have the report um, you'll be glad to know I'm not going to go through the report verbatim um, but I should just provide a bit of context and explain some of the proposed changes. Um, so at Cabinet in June 2021 the outside bodies were to be appointed but in the interim the existing appointments were agreed uh, to remain in place pending consideration of a further report on the matter. Uh, this, the, this report revisits and refreshes the existing protocol in light of benchmarking with other local authorities who have member champions and takes on board the comments made at the June Cabinet meeting uh, to remove the duplication of roles that have a remit which primarily sits within that of a Cabinet portfolio. To run through uh, the changes to the document itself, which is Appendix A, um, so paragraph one um, is confirmation that the appointment of these roles 
um, s should sit with the Cabinet, as it's not a matter reserved for full Council under Chapter 4 of the Constitution. Um, and as with the outside body appointments, it's an executive function, um, and that is as per the legal advice in paragraph 6.1 of the report. Uh, paragraph 2, um, the old Section B is essentially superfluous as it is covered by the old Section C, which is the new Section B. In essence, if you are no longer a councillor, you will no longer be um, the member champion. Um, part 3 uh, has been redrafted to make the role description a bit clearer for all parties. Um, and notes again to avoid duplication with cabinet portfolios and provide some general parameters um, to ensure the roles have an effective purpose. Paragraph 4 is unaltered, save to add a framework at the end for reporting back to Cabinet on an annual basis. And Paragraph 5 is a new paragraph with regard to conduct. Um, it's essentially been added uh, to provide clarity to post holders as to, again, further clarify the remit of their role. Um, the report, in addition to approving the revised protocol, uh, the Cabinet member is requested to approve the titles and nominations until the appointments are considered again, which would usually be the first Cabinet meeting of the new municipal year, so that would be usually June each year. Um, so the nominations are as per put in June, um, but with a number for the previous champion roles which fell or fall within the remit of cabinet portfolios subsumed into those portfolios as per the comments made at the June cabinet meeting and in accordance with the revised protocol if adopted. Um, that's all I have to say, so um, thank you very much. Thank you, James. Comments, Jeanette? Um, just a query, really. Um, in 3.4, and the third sector of City of Service is shown as a vacancy um, and the report saying that um, the nominations that were put in place um, in June would sort of just be carried forward. Appendix B then says the third sector City of Service, um, there was two nominations, Councillor Stuart Brown and myself, um, and I thought at the Cabinet meeting that Councillor Stuart Brown was elected uh, or uh, nominated and successful in that um, vacancy. So could you just confirm that is a vacancy or Councillor Brown is doing that? James. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding uh, from the meeting that uh, Councillor Brown was um, put forward by the leader um, to fulfil that position, but as the um, item was deferred, the existing appointments were agreed to continue until um, until uh, an, an, somebody else was appointed um, and there was a previous vacancy. So it's my understanding there is a vacancy uh, still for that position. So I can just follow up on that. Um, because it's the third sector and city of service, especially with COVID and the reply uh, that the communities need to do with COVID, I think it's really important we have a champion in that post. Um, so um, could I ask the chair to sort of take that back to cabinet um, and my understanding of that meeting, Councillor Brown was agreed um, because I was there at that meeting. So um, it's not that I want to do it, it's if Councillor Brown can do it, but I think it's important we have somebody there in the champion role. Agree, agree. I'll, I'll take that to Cabinet um, on Tuesday. Lee. Um, I was assuming that these p positions that are in Appendix B, you are actually going to be putting into place today. So. Um, so you will be choosing s someone to go into that role, whether it's Councillor Brown or Councillor Smith today. Is that not the case? Well, I, 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 James, I'd like to do that. Thank you. Um, just for clarity, um, there are three elements to the report. One is to consider and agree the revised protocol. Two, the titles in Appendix B and C uh, to appoint members to um, those said appointments. So I can, I can appoint? So, so in, if, indeed, if you wish well, to, yes. Jeanette? Can I nominate Councillor Brown then? Okay, yeah. So, Councillor Brown uh, will be the champion. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Happy? Okay, thank you. So, uh, it is recommended that I approve uh, the revised Member Champions Protocol at Appendix A of this report. Uh, I also approve the Member Champion titles at Appendix B of the report and finally appoint Councillor nominations to the Member Champion.
positions detailed in Appendix B of the report. James, thank you very much for your work on, on that report as well. Thank you. Next item, future ways of working, connectivity report, uh, Natasha's here. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll work on the assumption that you've read the report. Um, so really the purpose of uh, raising this with you today is in relation to the recommendations uh, that we um, that you, we brought, will ask you to nominate some representatives from each of the political groups so that there can be cross-party and officer engagement on how we as a council take forward working going forward in a COVID safe way, adopting new ways of working so as we learn to live with COVID going forward. There is some work already underway and we've been um, able to secure funding from a COVID grant um, to do some of that initial work um, and, and that is now progressing, particularly around standardising desk setups, um, a resource booking system to manage the capacity in our offices and equipment to enable meeting rooms to be um, facilitating hybrid meetings so that we can have more engagement with people who are working remotely and that includes partners as well as staff who might be working from home going forward in the future. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you for all, all your work around the connectivity project. It's an um, important piece of work, isn't it, as we uh, work our way through um, the pandemic and future uh, opportunities for how we work and live um, and hope to find a balance between the two. Uh, any questions or comments about the report? No questions, but are we going to take forward the um, group positions? Uh, in terms of forming a working group on this, because I think it's very important that we do. I don't think it's any surprise that I've not been keen on how the Council has been handling this, nor where it's been going forward. Um, but this is uh, for information only, so there's no point in me crying out my uh, soul to this. and um, just have to wait and see how we go in the elections. I would like to raise a couple of issues, though. Um, on back page, it says that Cabinet member um, and opposition spokespeople were invited to participate in workshops with Baker Stewart. I've got no recollection of that in May, and I have been doing a search on, so I can assume it would have been the previous cabinet, well, opposition spokesperson, but since May there was an election and we didn't really have anyone in post for the first half, and I was in post for the second half, it seems to have been a weird time to do the uh, workshops and with to invite people who are outgoing as the portfolio holders. I'd also like to raise something I've raised with you several times and the leader has also promised me that it will be sorted or to talk to you and that's about meeting rooms that we can actually meet and present from. At the moment this is the only room that we can have a meeting and present and make a decision in in the whole council for a city of our size that's quite appalling. We did used to have the executive meeting room but all the equipment from there has been taken out and over the other side but it's not been put into a meeting room it's off in the corner so in effect this is the only room we can make use of for any meeting we want to have so where we've been doing text meetings we are reliant on having to have the members of the public coming in rather than being able to watch it from home because there is no equipment up in the executive meeting room and I think we're quite short on that sort of facility which I think should be a priority for especially the engagement of the public and I know I've raised it with Councillor Dowling and uh, Councillor Vernon Jackson as well and they have also been quite alarmed about the situation so could that be a priority to be addressed? Natasha do you have a, a response? Yes, so um, depending on the nature of the meeting, one of the purposes of, of identifying um, a number of hybrid meeting rooms is so that you, you can have a different people involved in the meeting, not necessarily in the room. Um, so, you know, if it's a non-decision making meeting, then that, that sort of a hybrid meeting room would facilitate that. Uh, we are aware of the situation with regard to equipment for live streaming. Um, that's a slightly different issue and that's, that is something that we're also looking at um, to see what alternative technology solutions there might be to enable live streaming. At the moment we're relied, reliant on hardware and you're right, there's a set of hardware in this room and then a set of hardware 
in the civic office to facilitate virtual meetings, um, we would need to purchase additional hardware for each room that we then wanted to live stream in. So there's something that we are looking at going forward into next year as to how we can use different technology to live stream meetings, giving us a wider range and a greater flexibility of use of rooms to, to do that. So it is part of this program to look at how we can facilitate meetings as well as live streaming and remote access. Okay, I do again want to raise the issue that has been We've been in this pandemic situation for a long time. We have been back to live meetings for a long time. The executive meeting room upstairs has been used for meetings, yet it is still cut off. I think this is something that's just been left on the back burner. And I've raised the officers, and some of the officers do have ideas how it could be dealt with, but it hasn't been given a priority, and I think it really does need to be. It's not a case of looking how to redo it next year. We could be in a completely different situation by then. It needs to be something that was... We're in a worse situation now than we were previously. We used to have two rooms we could broadcast on. Now we only have one. Sorry, we're not waiting till next year um, for this work. So this work is progressing currently as we speak. So the, um, uh, the, the, the tender has gone out. We've selected suppliers. We are ready to go forward with putting the kit in to the various rooms um, so it's not it's not we don't have to wait till April it's 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 a case of what date do we have for completion um, I don't have that level of detail with me but I'm catching up with the program team on Friday so I can come back to you after that to look at the completion date but we're looking at having the kit in all of the meeting rooms by the end of March once we've def defined exactly all the meeting rooms that we're going to be putting it into, because we've got some decisions to make around which actual meeting rooms we put the kit into, because we operate not just from the Civic Office and the Guildhall, we operate from a number of different sites across the city and deliver services from, for example, Medina House, we have uh, children and family hubs, etc. So we're just working with services to prioritise all of those meeting rooms to make sure that we've got a good spread to enable effective service delivery. But the, the, the intention is all of that to be implemented and completed by the end of March this year. Is that, does that go some way to answering? Sorry? Does that go some way to answering? Not really, but I think it's as much as I'll get, so. Okay, okay well, well, we'll add it to our list of things to talk about at our next meeting. Okay, in terms of the, the cross-party work, um, I mean, if you want to go back to your groups and have a conversation about who might want to sit, oh, Jeanette. I've gone back to my group, and it's me. <laughs> it's yeah. you. There's only two of us, oh, so it's me. Well, it might have been, you know, could have been someone else. Um, do, do you want to put yourselves forward or, or, or go back to your groups? Or one. That's what we were looking for, wasn't it? I think in conversations. Well, one, one, one's, one's enough, isn't it? Um, I mean, if we want to point now... We don't have to. We don't have to. Okay, I'll take it back. To, I've, okay. I've got a group meeting soon, so I can okay, take yeah. it back to that. We'll, we'll catch up yeah. on that. Okay. Lee? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, we'll... Yeah, no, no. We'll, don't want to... Well, your, your voice will, uh, I'm sure, <laughs> represent everybody else. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll pick that up then. Okay, thank you. Anything else on connectivity? Thank you. Um, so I recommend that uh, and note the progress made to date and the upcoming work that will be delivered by the connectivity program. And again, I, I, I thank you. It's been a big piece of work. It continues to be a big piece of work, an important piece of work. So thank you and everybody else that uh, has been involved. Um, on to monitoring of the second quarter of 2021-22 revenue cash limits. Sue Page is here from Finance. Hi, Sue. Um, would you like to give us a brief Yes, just to overview. say that um, the overall position uh, quarter two for the council was reported to cabinet on the 30th of November. And this report... Sue, so ask you to get a little bit closer to the, the mic. <laughs> That's it. Sorry. And you. this report is the, specifically about this portfolio. Um, the overall position, after taking account of um, COVID-related costs and lost income and windfall items, is a net underspend on the portfolio of £82,000. 
um, the overall reads, all the reasons, the key reasons are set out in the text there from paragraphs um, 4.23 onwards, um, if anyone's got any questions on that. Um, that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And thank you for uh, always doing your best to explain these things in a way that I might understand. It's going to be quite tricky. Uh, Jeanette. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, as you know, I've been sort of asking for this sort of report to come to uh, um, um, this committee, um, and hopefully moving forward we'll have regular um, committees, even if it's for info only, um, so we can actually see what's happening. Um, Looking through the report, once again, in 4.6, information services is an overspend of 225,000, which is quite large and getting larger, um, even from when I was portfolio holder. Um, I accept the, the several factors, but how many, how many years are we going to keep accepting that information services are overspent without really tackling the issue and making sure that they come either on budget or underspend um, and are we doing anything to try and address that I'm sure we are but how do we do that basically thank you well, yes there's lots of activities it's a good opportunity to, to to talk about it I think Natasha it's probably best to pick if that's okay yeah no absolutely fine um, yeah the, the you're right the information services budget has been overspent for a number of years although I would say that a considerable amount of work has been done since last year when the overspend was probably closer to 600,000 um, so it's reduced quite a lot uh, over the last 12 months to to be closer to 200,000 and I think um, further work has been done so the next budget monitoring outturn is likely to show an even better picture than than the one that you have um, there is considerable amount of work underway in terms of delivering the IT strategy and IT transformation that is moving our infrastructure into the cloud and off the data center. A lot of the um, uh, expenditure within IT is to uh, address what's called technical debt. So that is um, IT infrastructure that is increasingly becoming obsolete or that is attracting very high support costs from suppliers because the IT industry is moving much more to a cloud-based uh, infrastructure than an on-premises infrastructure. The council took the decision in 2013 to build a data center at a point where the industry was moving to the cloud. Um, and that was an opportunity that was potentially missed back at that time. Um, that hardware and all the licenses associated with it are becoming increasingly costly as suppliers increase their costs to provide security, patching, etc., as they're encouraging their clients to move to the cloud. So that's what we're doing now, but we have a legacy of a very complex on-premise infrastructure that now has to be unpicked and moved into the cloud. The other thing that we are doing which is going to help in reducing our costs is decommissioning a number of systems that we no longer need or where the implementation of tools like M365 are providing viable alternatives to some of the systems that we have. So that enables us again to um, make the infrastructure less complicated and reduce the associated costs with that. So that work is all underway and as we move uh, more and more of our systems to the cloud, more and more comes off the data center and that reduces the cost. Um, the, and, and this is what the current IT strategy is, is looking to deliver um, going forward. It's also predicated on uh, a number of staffing savings in terms of delivering that um, infrastructure change and transformation. Um, because this, the journey for delivering the IT strategy started around about the same time that the pandemic hit, some of the activity had to be changed. So, you know, we had to roll out um, the ability to work remotely um, in, a, in a way that probably we wouldn't have planned had we not been in a COVID situation where we had to do it as quickly. So Teams came before 365, so there's a bit of an element of catch-up and that impacted on the ability to deliver some of those staffing savings that were associated with that um, with that piece of work as, as it was projected. So there are staffing savings being made, but, but certainly those that were predicated for this year are part year rather than full year. 
Next year, we will be in a position where the savings related to staffing will be full year rather than part year. So there are a number of activities that are under, underway that I am confident that by next year we will be in a break-even position in relation to the budget um, and we'll be aiming to not only deliver a, a, a much better IT service, much more resilient infrastructure, much more secure infrastructure, but also um, at, a, at a much lower cost than has been the case previously. Thank you, Natasha. And, and Sue, what's, what's the latest um, forecast out to? The latest forecast. Sorry, what's the latest outturn forecast? Outturn um, for IT, it is it is lower than the figure that's quoted here. So I mean, it's, it's coming down. It's going down. It's moving in that direction. Quite considerably, now, isn't yes. it? And I, you know, I have to t tell you, when I came into post, it was one of the two things I was most concerned about, and we've been working very hard on on it over the last year. Um, so, as Natasha said, hope I'm, pr I'm pretty confident it'll it will, won't it? Uh, and thank actually take this opportunity to thank the head of IT for working hard on that. Jeanette. Um, yeah, th this is in no relation to um, the staff within IT. Um, I've, they have worked extremely hard, um, as the rest of the staff have um, in the council, um, through the pandemic and everything else. So it's, n it's not a reflection on them. Um, I had a sharp intake of breath when you said it was 600,000, because obviously I didn't know that, because we've never had a report um, that said that. Um, I'm pleased to see that it's, it's going down. Um, and I will hold you to the break even um, because it's something we really need to get a financial control of IT. Um, it's been going on for many years, even before the pandemic. Um, but I'm glad to see that it's now one of our priorities. So thank you. I have to tell you, um, I will also hold. <laughs> I mean, it genuinely was one of two things when I. So I, you know, we've done made significant progress. I think. Sue, so, sorry back to you. No, I have nothing more to add on that. Any other questions, comments? Uh, good. Okay. Uh, so this item is for noting. I therefore note the report. Okay, next item, workforce profile. Uh, back to you, Natasha. Yeah, thank you. So um, what you have is a workforce profile report. This pro profiles the workforce for the year 2019 and the year 2020. Um, it is something that we should be doing and publishing on an annual basis. So I'm very pleased to uh, be able to present that information now for, for those two years um, and to commit to doing that annually going forward. Um, it is a really, really important part of understanding our workforce and complying with the public sector equality duty, but also, and more importantly, understanding, identifying any issues that we might have, um, assessing our performance, and the most important, actually taking action to make sure that our workforce is, um, our workplace is inclusive and our workforce is as diverse as it can be and is representative of the communities that we serve. So without that level of data, it's very difficult to know um, actually what, what our workforce looks like and uh, what barriers there may be for staff with different protected characteristics. What it has done is identify a number of gaps um, in our data, but also in our data collection. So we've got plans underway, which are outlined in the report, to address those gaps. Um, but it also gives us a baseline against which we can measure our progress against various initiatives um, as we take our strategy forward for our workforce and bro more broadly for diversity and uh, equalities across the city. Thank you. Um, Jeanette. Um, yeah, thank you for that report and it's really comprehensive and um, the Chair also knows that I've been uh, banging on about um, equality and the duty on this anyway. So I've got one comment and one question, two questions, sorry. Um, the comment is in 3E, um, the equalities data of applying for jobs, um, well that was systems thinking that took all that out, which is why I don't like systems thinking, because it has caused us a gap that is quite large so um, um, that's just a, a sort of a comment sort of going forward so the two questions I have are one um, from employment committee we've got a race equality paper succession planning and gender pay gap and how does that feed into the equality um, annual report um, or does it 
um, does it need to be separate? And the other question is, is how do members, officers and services use the EIA as part of the toolkit to improving quality and diversity and inclusion, and it's not just a tick box? So, um, two very, very good questions. Um, I think you're absolutely right to identify where the race equality and the gender pay gap fit into this in an overarching way. That is absolutely a gap we need that we need to address. So that is something that we, we are looking at going forward. And actually, um, I think Carolina's only at, what, week two? <laughs> but it's one of the conversations that we've already started in terms of priorities for her as our Equalities Officer in terms of how do we bring all of this together. Uh, we have the opportunity to refresh our equality strategy in 2022 um, and we use, we're, we're aiming to use that opportunity to start to look at what different mechanisms we need to have in place for reporting um, as well as for monitoring some of our data. There are, uh, you know, this whole area of equality, diversity and inclusion is absolutely massive so we need to take the opportunity to put some structure and framework around it so that we are using the data to point us in the direction of what the priority areas are. Um, we know race is a priority area, I think the pandemic has shown up significant uh, race equality issues um, nationally, globally as well as in the city. Um, but we also have a number of gaps, particularly around our LGBTQ communities uh, and focus, um, as well as in our data gathering. So I can't, I can't tell you that this is what is going to happen, but what I can tell you is that we, we've identified that as an issue that we are going to be working on going forward. So, um, and obviously as outlined in the report, where an annual report hasn't been done as was committed in the previous strategy, but that is something, again, that we'll be looking to reinstate going forward with the new strategy. The second question was around um, equality impact assessments. Um, and I was actually just this afternoon before I came to this meeting having a conversation with colleagues um, about the need to review and update our approach to impact assessments across the piece um, and look at what we can do in that space, not only to make sure that, equality, that, that all impact assessments, but particularly equality impact assessments, are not just tick box exercises, but are actually meaningful and what actions we might need to take to um, uh, to embed these as, as living documents in the way that we work. And actually this is where projects and programs like connectivity can actually assist in some of that cultural change because the the um, one of the things and this is seizing opportunities that have arisen from the pandemic, we know that events impact on people in significant ways. So using that learning in terms of how we use impact assessments, not just for decision meetings and tick, ticking boxes, but also in how we think about how we deliver services on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is something that I'm going to be um, taking forward with colleagues going forward. I literally just had the meeting this afternoon to discuss the fact that we're going to need to review it and I'm going to be assigning that to a member of my team. Okay. Well, good luck with that one, <laughs> because of the culture change. Um, yeah. But um, at least we're now sort of back on track and, you know, going through it in a sort of a comprehensive way. Um, sort of the questions really came into the workforce profile and the equality and diversity um, inclusion paper as well. So um, it, it, it's making sure that it is not used as a tick box exercise. Um, and my fear is it is already, um, but. I think if we can get some sort of movement on that, which you look like you've already started, then I think we can get that ball rolling, that it becomes an integral part of what we do um, and second nature in what we do, rather than, oh, we've got to go and do an EIA. Um, and, and I haven't succeeded in that in the last 18 years with the council, so I, I wish you luck. I like a challenge. <laughs> indeed, indeed, but you're in the right place. Uh I mean, one of the conversations we have over and over again is that everything in uh, in this in this area, in equality, diversity, and inclusion, must be meaningful. Things that we do must be meaningful, and that's that. You know, that's the conversation we have all the time. 
Um, so, uh, and you know, Carolina and James being here will help us to achieve because you, you need your resources to do these things as well. It's a big piece of work and it takes time and, uh, and energy. So, um, I, I just want to take this opportunity while well, there are three people watching actually to, to thank the staff for AC Quality Network who have been a really terrific um, addition to um, the support uh, the city has around Easy Eye. Um, and, um, and I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to be a, an officer of, of the Staff for Race Equality Network. And, uh, and those kind of things really are, are helpful and people give up their time to, to come along and, um, and to get involved. It, it's been terrific over the last year. Um, anything else? Lee? I, I've got a few complaints and comments, so... Okay, I'll put my surprise face on. Yeah. Uh, first one, um, in B, referencing the 54% of the workforce who live on Port Sea Island, the city is actually PO1 to PO6, not PO1 to PO5. And I know it can often be forgotten that Cosham, Drayton Farns and Pools go over past the city. Our figures would actually have looked a lot better if we'd done the city boundaries, which we managed to use for education, tax purpose, everything else, rather than saying, oh, we'll just look at this 54% live on Port Sea Island. Port Sea Island is, I think, irrelevant in this situation. It is the city, so it should have been done to PO1 to PO6, and I have a major gripe with that. I, I think it's a, probably a reasonable comment, isn't it? And can we... I can see you making a nice bit, so we'll... We can, so. Yeah, we can adjust that going forward. Absolutely, yeah, we can. Thank you, Lee. And apologies. Yeah. And also in... Um, moving down to D... Whilst I do think that religion shouldn't really play a part in someone's employment process, and I think it, a lot of other people feel the same way, the fact that only a third of people respond on that question, and even of those that respond, it's still quite a low figure that have a religion. On page 60 of the 9th, uh, 2019 survey, it does list out the wrong way send a higher proportion of males working at PCC are Christian, females are more likely to have no religion than males. It's actually the opposite way around. But I do know that's been corrected in the 2020 version. But it might be worthwhile correcting in the previous edition if it's going to be given out and used. And furthermore, whilst I did sort of think, oh, that looks good, we've got um, gone up 1% of our BAME um, employment, then I noticed that we had dropped... 3% in reporting, so I don't, from 78% down to 75, so I wonder if that was really just a drop in the number of people reporting has pushed up, not the actual change. So I think that could be made a little bit clearer. Okay. Is that improvement. possible? Well, well, I think this is precisely why we do this level of analysis, is to ask exactly these kinds of questions to try and understand what's going on. Why, why has there been a drop in reporting? And is it the drop in reporting that's pushed that number up? Uh, what is the underlying reason for a drop in reporting? I think that's absolutely the right question to be asking, which is why we do this level of analysis to understand what's going on. Um, and then to, to, then to ask any follow-up questions that may arise from that, because you know this, this is just a, a data set. What we do with it is what's important in terms of understanding the workforce and the reasons why people may be behaving in a particular way, either under-reporting or not applying for roles or uh, are not updating their information and keeping it and keeping it up to date. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, any other questions, observations? Okay, thank you. Well, as this item is for noting, I therefore note the report. And finally, equality, diversity and inclusion. Back to you, Natasha. Thank you. So again, this uh, report um, outlines progress against the uh, 2019 to 2022 Equality and Diversity Strategy, uh, but then also provides a summary of some of the activity that's been underway throughout the period of response to the pandemic that has a specific focus on equality and diversity. Um, I think unfortunate, the, the, some unfortunate combination of events meant, has meant that we haven't managed 
to progress or complete as many of the objectives set out in the strategy, although uh, quite a few are now underway. Uh, but I think it's probably also worth noting um, a number of activities that have been undertaken in addition to the objectives set out in the strategy. So um, there, has, there has been not there's been no complacency, but there has been. It's been disappointing that we haven't managed to, to complete as much as we would have liked to um, in in the period of of the strategy. Having said that, we have, as I said earlier, the opportunity to refresh the strategy uh, and uh, further progress the objectives um, and develop those along a, a wider range of of strands and areas of priority for the city. Thank you. Any questions or? comments on the report? No? Well, again, I want to thank you and uh, and everyone who has, has really kind of <coughs> got to grips with this. It's, again, it's, you know, it's, you know how important it is to me that we do this and we make it meaningful and um, we support um, this, this area of work, which is why well, we're very pleased to see Caroline and James um, here today and um, looking forward to, to working with you in the, the coming months. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity also just to re reassure anyone who might be listening in um, that we are committed to equality, diversity and inclusion in this city and that's, that's who we want to be. That's who we are. Um, thank you very much. Um, as this report is for information only, I, or note, is it, what do we call it? It's for noting. I therefore note the report. Um, and I think that concludes today's business. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, have a good and safe evening.